Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord, at your divine baptism in the Jordan River, you revealed that you are the consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds and our hearts on this day of your great epiphany. Make us holy by the indwelling of your Spirit, and make us worthy to celebrate this feast of lights, so that we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Thank you. 
before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, proclaim life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen, give glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Apostle John wrote, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John further testified, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from the sky and to remain and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water had told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, this is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and have borne testimony that he is the Son of God. This is the truth, peace be with you. John the Baptist and John the Evangelist, the writer of this Gospel, who never mentions his own name, but we know from the Gospel that John was one of the young men who followed John the Baptist to the Jordan, along with, we also know, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. And these young men who were around John during the time that he was preaching the coming of God's judgment, the day of the Lord, they were enthusiastic, they were following this great prophet. There had not been a prophet in Israel for four centuries. But what John is pointing out is that from the epiphany, the theophany, when our Lord is baptized in the Jordan, and you have the manifestation of the voice of God from heaven, the presence of God incarnate being baptized, and the Spirit of God being manifested by the dove, this theophany, this manifestation of God, it is something which is given to give testimony to who this man is who is beginning. It's the very beginning of his apostolate. And in fact, when you look at the luminous mysteries of the rosary, which is being said on Thursdays normally, they're very much in line with our Syriac spirituality because we begin with the baptism of our Lord, the Epiphanies. We then go to the miracle of the changing of water into wine, the first sign, which of course in our Syriac tradition is the Sunday that begins the great fast, Cana Sunday. Then we have the preaching of the kingdom, the emphasis upon the will of God being manifested. And the fourth is the transfiguration. At the end of the three years of our Lord's ministry, we have the voice of the Father in the beginning in the baptism saying, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And at the end of three years being said to Peter, James, and John, This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. Hear Him. That is transfiguration. The fourth joyful mystery, uh, the luminous mystery, excuse me, 
And the fifth luminous mystery, the institution of the Eucharist, the divine mystery by which God manifests himself on a day-to-day -day basis within the kingdom which is the church on earth. So what St. John is pointing out to us is two things. One, he's talking about following the baptism of our Lord. So this Sunday, following the Epiphany, is that John the Baptist himself points out to these young men, to the disciples around him, this is the Son of God, this is the Lamb of God, pointing to our Lord, who takes away the sin of the world. Notice in the Gospel it's singular. The liturgy often we use it in the plural, it takes away the sins of the world. But in fact, in the Gospel, it refers to the fundamental tarnish, the fundamental blemish upon the human race from paradise, what we call original sin. That is the sin which is removed from humanity to allow each individual man to be able to come, be transformed by grace in this light of the epiphany. Now, I said it's two Johns who are here. John is giving testimony, and he speaks about the fact that he was not told by God who the Messiah was to be. Now, if we remember from the Annunciation in the Gospel of St. Luke, St. John is our Lord's cousin. Clearly, they didn't grow up together. And it's most likely by this indication that Elizabeth and Zechariah died soon after John's birth. Because they never tell him the events of the visitation, of the presence of the Messiah and the Mother of God who comes to visit while he's still in the womb. He recognizes the presence, obviously, he leaps in the womb of his mother, but he's not given any other stories. He tells us in this Gospel today, as recorded by St. John, that the one who sent him to begin his work of prophecy and announcing the coming of the kingdom, that he was not told who it was going to be. He was only told, the one upon whom you see the Spirit of God descend, that is the one who will be baptizing by the Holy Spirit. Because the baptism of John and the baptism in the church are two different things. The baptism of John was one of repentance. It was an external ceremony that was done to show that I repent of my past misdoings. I repent of my sins. I step into the water. And I signify by this cleansing my desire to turn to better, my conversion. But it didn't do anything interiorly to the individual. Whereas baptism, as we celebrate in the divine mystery, of course, not only has the aspect of water externally, but that indication of the cleansing externally indicates the grace which is being given internally, which is the transformation of the spirit and that healing, and that removal of the sin that the Lamb of God came to take away. So there are two different things, which is why when our Lord descends into the river Jordan of the Epiphany, He transforms water by His divine presence. The water has become a source for the divine mysteries of baptism. So what St. John is pointing out is that that baptism which you witness, that theophany, that epiphany, that he is the Lamb of God himself and he will baptize in fire and in the Holy Spirit. And then St. John goes on to tell us about the fact that he didn't know who this man was going to be. But just that you will see by seeing the Spirit upon him. And then he says, I give testimony to what I know about this man. And this is the link where we move from the epiphany as being a historical story to the reality that brings us to the pews these days. We learn our faith from someone. And they receive their faith from someone. And they receive their faith from someone. And there is a testimony and a witness going back in link all the way back to that day of the Epiphany. No one ever starts saying one day, they're sitting in their living room having no background, saying, I'm a Christian. We always come by knowing someone. Now historically, throughout most of the recent centuries, it's always been through our parents. The parents confided that faith to the next generation. But it's a link. They had received it normally from their parents, and their parents from their parents. 
And that link is the testimony which we see in the gospel today. St. John is telling the young men with him, this is the Lamb of God. In other words, you now move to the next stage. You leave me and you go and follow him. And that's what we're told. John and Andrew run after him. They say, where do you stay? Teach us. And that testimony which is given becomes then the apostles around our Lord and from the apostles it descends generation to generation, which is why in a couple of weeks' time, our weeks that begin the three commemorations of the dead, the first week is the priesthood. We commemorate all the dead priests because while we, we, we may receive it from our parents to the children, sometimes that link is broken. The apostolic link, which is unbroken, is from priest to priest to priest to priest to priest that runs as the thread throughout the body of Christ from the resurrection, from Pentecost, all the way down to this present day. And therefore, we commemorate the deceased priests who made up that single, unique priesthood of the apostolic link throughout the body of Christ from the beginning. But St. John is giving a very important point to us personally here. It is the importance of testimony. We have seen. St. John, if you look, if you have the occasion, look up the first letter of St. John and read the beginning of it. There's such an impression on this young man of St. John the Baptist pointing out the Lamb of God that he himself, who later on, of course, was on to become an apostle, and for decades lives, outlives every one of the apostles. And from this story that we have in the gospel today, Paul that goes on and lives for another 70 years. That when he writes his first letter, he says, I, we announce to you what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched, the word of God in our midst. And we announce this to you and give testimony of it so that you yourselves may also believe. Now obviously he's writing this letter to people who are already baptized and believers, but he's reminding them that this is a testimony which you have been given, that God has appeared among us historically, incarnate, baptized in the Jordan. And that reality is something we pass from generation to generation by the faith and he says that what we have seen and touched, we announce to you. Now these people believe already, but they didn't see our Lord. This is years after these events. And he says, we announce this to you so that you yourselves may enter into the same communion that we have with that word of life. It's a very magnificent understanding of the faith. It's not an intellectual thing. You just memorize a catechism. It is something which is known and experienced in the reality of the Christ present among us. And of course, with Christmas, what we emphasize is the fact of the historical presence of the Word of God, God Himself among us. And then we have the testimony of the resurrection. These are the bookends of that reality of the experience of the Christian faith. And so, to leave you with a practical point, this is the reason why, week after week, we are at the liturgy and the divine mysteries. And why you're to be congratulated because you've once again weathered another sub-zero day. Tomorrow, when it hits the 20s, we should be running around in shorts at this point because it'll feel like summer. I was out doing Epiphany blessings last night. It was like 10 below zero coming back to the, back to the parish. But in this reason why we come to the liturgy again and again and the masses and the prayers and the hymns which are sung so beautifully, is because they form us in that experience of our ancestors, of those who came before us and those who came before us from the plains of the Middle East of the Antiochian Church. We come because it forms us, not because we get something in the sense we come to adore God who has acted not only in history, but in our own personal lives individually. And we enter into the divine mysteries. Some people daily at St. Jude's Chapel, we enter into them because they form us. Day after day, 
at least week after week, it makes us the children of God. They kind of pop up once every three years. It doesn't make us the children of God. It just we make some kind of intellectual response to my great grandparents who were Catholics, and so I pop up on occasion. That doesn't make us the children of God. That's why we repeat Sunday after Sunday, week after week, the day of the resurrection, we enter into these divine mysteries of the forgiving altar of the Lord because it is that sacramental reality of divine mystery which gives us the ability to testify to that same faith that what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched. And that is what we transmit to those around us. That is the testimony that St. John was speaking about this morning. And may the prayers of St. John, the precursor, the baptizer, intercede for us, that we ourselves can also in our own lives give testimony to what we have seen and heard. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. us 
Mother of God, Saint Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint John the Baptist. Remember, O oh God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the repose of Malcolm Spencer. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
O God the Father, you accept prayers and answer petitions. You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you, to call upon you with pure souls and clear consciences, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation,
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you, giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink, O lover of all people. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O passion, and merciful one, O lover of all people, have Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your 
goodness and the salvation you have just given us, who can give you the glory you truly deserve. In our weakness, and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your Holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.